So I'm going to speak English for the benefit of uh, some young postdocs and students who are here in the room. And I think uh, also Boris is going to speak English and Marjorie is going to speak English. So the scientific part of the meeting is going to be in English. So I'm Slava Rychkov. I'm professor of physics here at HES. So I'm too young to have met Louis Michel, but I have read many of his papers. So I know him through his papers and also know him through speaking to his collaborators, to Pierre Toledano, uh, to Edouard Brezin, who unfortunately both they couldn't be here today. So I, because of this, I, I, I got to know Louis and I got to respect his work. So for, for this meeting, I decided to present a small, a very small part of, uh, of his work, uh, the work that he did around 1980-1985. So it's the work related to the theory of phase transitions, critical phenomena and the immunization group. Simply because this is something that is related to, to my own research and uh, something that I found useful for my own work and tried to carry a little bit further. So l let me just start with some very basic uh, definitions and facts. So I'm going to uh, talk about phase transitions. And uh, so what is a phase? We, I have in mind uh, some substances, some materials. And when we have such a material, we can study how its properties change when we vary uh, thermodynamic parameters like pressure or temperature. And when we do this, then uh, the space of parameters, it gets divided into several regions, which are called phases. Uh, within each region, the properties of the material, they change analytically. So they change smoothly and analytically with temperature and with pressure. And when you cross the boundary between these two regions, then there are some uh, non analyticities some discontinuities. And uh, so the, the main thermodynamic quantity is free energy. So free energy can changes continuously in this space, in this plane. But when you cross these boundaries, then you can have typically uh, either discontinuities in the first derivatives of the free energy, and this is called first order phase transitions, or sometimes you may have discontinuities in the second derivative. So the first derivative is continuous. So this is called second order uh, phase transition. And uh, the examples of the first order transition is the liquid solid transition and uh, the example of a second order transition is the Curie point in magnet as a function of temperature. And so uh, for this talk, the important, uh, I'm going to focus on second order transitions. And so the first successful theory of the second order transitions, it was built by Landau in 1937. So Landau, uh, he understood that these second order transitions, they are most often related to the change in the symmetry of, uh, of the substance with the reduction of symmetry. So when you vary, uh, when you vary some parameter, for example, temperature, you will have <coughs> a more symmetric phase and a less symmetric phase, it's called, also called broken phase. And uh, less symmetric or more symmetric is formulated mathematically in terms of group theory. So there is a group G, which is associated with a more symmetric phase. And there is some subgroup, some proper subgroup of this group H, which is associated with the less symmetric phase. And so what do those groups act on? Well, Landau introduced the concept of the order parameter. So the order parameter is a vector phi. It's an, it's an n-dimensional vector. Uh, and this n-dimensional space carries a representation, a reducible representation of 
the group G, of the more symmetric group G. So it's an orthogonal representation, so the group G thus becomes a subgroup of the group ON. <coughs> so this is the basic setting. And you see here, okay, the appearance of groups, and uh, Louis Michel was uh, the master of group theory, so clearly here something that he could have played with, as we will see. And so another important quantity that uh, uh, Landau introduced is, uh, is the free energy functional. So the free energy functional f of phi, or function, it's, it's a function of phi, so of this order parameter. So it has to be actually minimized over phi to get the true free energy. And this function, it has the main property of this function is that it, is, uh, it has to be invariant under the action of the group. So it's a G invariant function. And so I it has, we can, for simplicity, we can limit ourselves to two terms in this function. The first term is the quadratic term. So it's just some parameter mu times the length squared of phi, so phi phi. So this is the quadratic term. And then there is a quartic term, p4 of phi, which is some homogeneous quartic polynomial of phi, which is an invariant polynomial of the group G. So every group G in a reducible representation will have a certain number of uh, invariant polynomials. Uh, and so this P4 of phi should be some linear combination of this linearly independent mm. G invariant polynomials. So it's a problem of group theory, how to, to classify these polynomials. Uh, which I'm not going to discuss here. And in the Landau theory, the only property of this P4 polynomial is that it should be growing at infinity, so that at large values of phi, this free energy functional goes to infinity, and at small values of phi, it, something interesting may happen. And so uh, what happens at small values of phi depends on the values of this parameter mu. Uh, it uh, can have, can take positive values or negative values. If it, if it takes a positive value, then we get a symmetric phase. Why is that? Well, because this function f of phi has then this sort of shape. So it has a minimum at phi equals zero. So that's the, this is the, and the value phi equals zero is symmetric with respect to action of the whole of group G. On the other hand, if we take uh, negative value, then you get phi equals zero is an unstable point. It's, a, it's an extreme, it's a, it's a local maximum. And so there's going to be some minimum at a non-zero value of phi. And that's uh, the broken phase. Uh, and what is the value of the, what is the group H? This is the broken uh, symmetry group. It's the isotropy subgroup of phi zero. So it's a subgroup of G which leaves phi, phi zero invariant. So th this is how Lando set things up, and it's, uh, it's been a, a, a very <coughs> successful theory. And actually, one more important condition, so which group G has to satisfy. So I talked about second order invariant, phi squared. I talked about quartic invariance of the group G. And the more very important condition is that the group G should not have any cubic invariant. And if it does have this cubic invariant, then the prediction of Landau theory is the transition should be first order. Because then we would have to add a cubic term into this Landau uh, potential f of phi. And this cubic term, it would change the picture that I described in such a way that the parameter phi changes not continuously, but discontinuously. OK, so we are in 37, and a very important uh, addition to this Landau theory was made by Kenneth Wilson in, uh, in 1971. So when he created the theory of the randomization group and the base theory of the second order phase transitions. So the theory of Wilson, it builds upon Landau's theory. So it basically takes over all the things that I said so far and it adds to them one extra requirement. 
So in Landau's theory, as I said, this polynomial P4 of phi, it could be arbitrary G invariant polynomial of the group G. And in Wilson's theory, this polynomial should satisfy just one extra constraint. It's not arbitrary, but should satisfy one extra constraint. So let me describe this constraint. So to describe this constraint, I write this polynomial P4 of phi, I write it as a linear combination of monomials. So I introduce here this tensor lambda, which is a symmetric G invariant uh, for tensor lambda. And I define a certain function on all four tensors, function called A. So this function, it's a real function on four tensors, and it takes the following form. So it's a, it's a cubic function. It has two terms, one term which is uh, negative lambda squared. And when I write lambda squared, I mean uh, a contraction of lambda with itself over all indices, what I write here. That's the first term. And the second term is lambda cube. So it's a contraction of, of the product of three lambdas over indices. Now, each lambda has four indices. And now I split them into two pairs of two by two and I contract the indices accordingly. So this is what I have here. We have a term uh, where I just take four indices of lambda and contract it four indices of other lambda. It's the first term. And this is the second term where I take two indices of lambda and contract them with this lambda, with this lambda, with this lambda, like this. So that's, that's a definitely, uh, you know, that's a possible function of lambda to consider. And the most important property of this function is that this function is on invariant. So if I take the tensor lambda, I rotate it by the on n transformation, then A doesn't change. Now, the it doesn't want to go back forward. OK. So the main rule of Wilson's theory is that we are only supposed to consider tensors lambda such that they are local minima of this function A of lambda. Not arbitrary, but only local minima of this function A of lambda. OK, function A of lambda is, uh, is defined on all tensors of lambda, but there is also this group G. So we only, we, we only have to consider this function A of lambda restricted to the set of tensors which are invariant under group G and find local minima of this function. So uh, here I have to make two remarks. So where is the randomization group? So there is no randomization group here. Well, uh, I, for mathematical purposes, I formulated everything in terms of this function A of lambda, but we can view this function as a potential of, uh, of a flow, which is going to correspond to the gradient of, of this function A. So this is the potential flow. And this flow is the randomization group flow in some approximation. So this flow tells us that uh, the tensor lambda doesn't stay constant, but it changes as we vary uh, from short distances to long distances. And the fact that we are only supposed to consider lambdas which are local minima of this function A means that we are only interested in lambdas which are stable fixed points of this randomization group flow. So that's, that's uh, the meaning of this rule. So instead of talking of local minima, I can also call them stable fixed points. Uh, within, always within the subspace of tensors which are invariant under the group uh, under the group G. And the second uh, remark that I would like to make is that the existence of this local minima or stable fixed points is not at all guaranteed. So our function uh, A is a cubic function. So it's not bounded. It's not bounded uh, from below. At, at infinity, in, one, in some directions it goes to minus infinity, in some directions it goes to plus infinity. So 
it might be that this function doesn't have any local minima. It might be that in any direction you will just escape to minus infinity. So what happens then if you don't have any local minima? Well, then uh, uh, Wilson's theory predicts that the phase transition should be first order. So that's uh, a, a, an interesting new type of first order predictions, which are called fluctuation driven first order phase transitions. So now uh, I, I finally can formulate the problem on which Louis Michel worked. The problem is this. So I have here number n, which is the dimension of the order parameter. I have a group G, which is a subgroup of n. So this group has to satisfy already uh, on basis of Landau theory, has to satisfy two requirements. It has to be an irreducible subgroup of n. And it has to satisfy the Landau condition, no cubic invariance. So the problem is to determine all such groups G for which there exists a local minimum on the subset of tensors invariant under the group G. Are you talking about Li subgroups or discrete subgroups? Could be Li subgroups, could be discrete subgroups. Both cases are interesting. I mean, the Li group, Li, the Li cases easier because there are, is a small number of least subgroups, but there is a, there's a huge number of discrete subgroups. And, and, uh, and Louis Michel knew the theory of uh, groups very well. He, he knew some complicated cases of group theory, like uh, associated with crystallographic groups. So he was well prepared to think about this problem, and he thought about this problem for five or six years, from 1980 to 1985. And in fact, since, you know, uh, so he arrived to think about this problem. As I said, Wilson introduced uh, this, his theory in 1971. And so Michel started to work on this only about 10 years later. So in these 10 years, a lot of results uh, have already been obtained by people who didn't know as much group theory as Louis Michel, but who just proceeded on an intuitive level and then maybe by trial and error, and they obtained uh, um, many, uh, many results. Uh, and so the contribution of Louis Michel was uh, twofold. Uh, first, he, he was able to prove a couple of structural results who, who, which clarified a lot this picture which was before obtained just by trial and error. So it explains some things that people have seen but didn't really understand why they were the case. And he also, as a second contribution, he solved one particular case of this problem completely. But in general, this problem is still far from being fully solved. So let me then describe a couple of theorems that, uh, that Louis uh, Michel proved in his work. So the first theorem is uh, very interesting because it has a cor corollary that if a stable fixed point, if a local minimum exists, then it's necessarily unique. And so this, uh, uh, this theorem goes as follows. So let's suppose that there are two uh, well, here's a misprint. So le let's suppose that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are two, uh, not local minima, this is a misprint, are two extremal points, two critical points of the function A of lambda. So let us consider, let us compare the values of this A function on uh, these two points lambda 1 and lambda 2. So I'm, I'm going to Compare A of lambda 1 versus A of lambda 2. And so there are two possibilities. Like one possibility is that one of these uh, critical points, so lambda 1 and lambda 2 are critical points, not necessarily local minima. We don't know what they are. So if A of lambda 1 is less than A of lambda 2, then the theorem says that lambda 2 is necessarily unstable, cannot be a local minimum. 
that's easy. I'm going to explain how it follows. And the second part of the theorem, which is less trivial, it says that suppose that a of lambda 1 is equal to a of lambda 2. Well, then you could say, well, perhaps they are both stable local mu. No. In this case, the theorem says that actually both of these points are unstable. It cannot be a local minima. So, uh, well, the proof of this theorem is really very, very easy. Let me just give it for you. Uh, so, uh, the key point is that this function A is a cubic function. So, recall it's minus lambda lambda plus lambda, lambda, lambda. So if I have two points here, lambda 1 and lambda 2, let me consider what this function does on the line which contains the two points, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Well, it's a cubic function, and at one, at one point, it has, it, it, it's a, it, these are both extremal points. So we have extremal point at lambda 2, extremal point at lambda 1, and they, do not, they are not equal to each other. Well, it just means that this function does something like that. So this is lambda 1, this is lambda 2, and this is lambda 1. And since it does something like that, it means that, that at the point lambda 2, it's not a local minimum. End of the proof of the first part. The second part is more interesting. So we have equality here. And so in this case, actually, if you consider the, the value of the function on this line containing lam con con connecting lambda 1 and lambda 2, then on this whole line, because it's a cubic function, it has to be a constant. So we have a whole line where this function is a constant. And then the idea of Louis-Michel was to consider what this, what this function does in a plane, in the whole plane which contains lambda 1 and lambda 2. We have this line on which this function is a constant, but also recall that this function is an on invariant function, so it's rotationally invariant. And so it's also constant on every radial line. Uh, radial curve, not radial, uh, cir circle around the origin, it is, a it is constant. So in particular, it is constant on this curve. And so if you look now at, at the point lambda 1, uh, we see that there are two directions in which uh, the function is constant. It means that the, uh, the second derivative of the function vanishes in two different directions. And there is one direction, namely the radial direction, in which the derivative is positive. Well, a quadratic form which has one positive direction and two zero directions necessarily has at least one negative direction. So end of the proof. So that's, that's the theorem. And this theorem is very powerful because it says indeed that if the local minimum exists, then it's unique. And that explained what people have seen before Louis Michel in many, many explicit <coughs> calculations. And by explicit calculations, I mean take a group G, compute its uh, set of quartic invariants, uh, write down uh, this function A, look for local minima, and you always found that the local minima, if it existed, was always unique. Well, here's a, the here's a reason. Now, let me explain uh, another uh, theorem of Louis Michel. So that this theorem explained uh, something else that people have seen in many, many uh, calculations before Louis Michel. So they observed that, uh, OK, I talked about this group G. The group G uh, should not be a very small group. It should be sufficiently large. Why is that? Well, because if the group is small, then first of all, it's not going to be irreducible. So, of course, irreducible subgroups of AN, they should be sufficiently large. Also, if the group is small, it will, uh, have, it will have some cubic invariance. And as we said, there should be no cubic invariance. Uh, but even 
you know, e even if you impose the reducibility and, and the Landau condition, there are still, uh, you know, many possibilities for this uh, subgroups G, some of them large and some of them small. And people observed that uh, in the cases where this subspace of quartic invariance is large, then typically you never find a stable fixed point. You find some fixed points, you find some critical points of this function A, but they're all unstable. Why is that? So, Louis Michel proved the theorem, which explains why this is the case. It was in collaboration with uh, his student Jean-Claude Toledano. So, uh, the theorem is, has a group theoretical criterion. So, it says, take this uh, uh, critical point lambda star. So, it has its own symmetry G star. And this uh, critical point, it lives in this space of quartic tensors lambda 4G. With this space of quartic tensors, you can associate another subgroup of OAN, which is the normalizer subgroup. It's a subgroup consisting of all uh, elements of OAN, which leave this space T4G invariant. Now, let us look at this normalizer subgroup, and let us compare it to the symmetry of the fixed point lambda star, to the, to the subgroup G star. If this space T4G is large, then the normalizer subgroup is also going to be large. And it may happen that this normalizer subgroup is strictly larger than G star. So this is going to typically happen. If the space is large, the normalizer subgroup is going to be very large, and you will have that this normalizer subgroup is larger than G star. Well, the theorem says that in this case, lambda star cannot be local mean. End of story. You can conclude it without doing any computations. And this theorem has an even uh, simpler proof than this first theorem. It's actually an easy color col corollary of, of the first theorem. So here we have a critical point lambda star. Let us suppose that the normalizer subgroup is larger than, uh, than the symmetry group of lambda star. Well, then exists some element of the normalizer subgroup which acting on lambda star gives us some other tensor, let, us, let me call it lambda star prime, which lies in the same space T4G. And, uh, if lambda star is a critical point of A, then lambda star prime is also the critical point of A. And since one was obtained from the other by acting of, by ON transformation, they have exactly the same value of A. And so, according to theorem one, if you have two critical points which have exactly the same value of A, then they are both unstable. End of proof. So, uh, let me, uh, to, to conclude, let me come back to this problem that I stated. So, that given n, the, the dimension of the order parameter, it's, it is of importance for physics to classify all the subgroups of n, which give rise to a stable fixed point. Because by classifying these subgroups, we are going to be able to classify all possible second order phase transitions which are of interest to physics. And unfortunately, this problem has been so far only partly solved. So, the, so far, uh, this problem has been solved only for n equal 2, 3, 4, and 5. For other results, they are partial, for other values of n, there are only partial results. So, let me, let me say uh, what is known. For n equal 2 and 3, these are simple cases. You can solve this problem basically by inspection. And you find that the only interesting uh, fixed point is the fully ON invariant fixed point. So, there is no fixed point which breaks symmetry. For n equal 4, the next case, the problem is, from the group theory point of view, becomes extremely complicated. 
because O4, well, O4 is a big group. It has many, many, well, it has infinitely many subgroups. And in 1985, Louis Michel with uh, his students, uh, Jean-Claude and Pierre Toledano, and with Edouard Brézin, they solved the classification problem of stable fixed points for this setting. So actually, the paper is extremely impressive. So I think it was well beyond, well ahead of its time. And it goes through, like it goes through the full list of the subgroups of O4, very long list. So then they, they do necessary group theory to select out of these groups irreducible subgroups, to select the subgroups which uh, satisfy the Landau condition, then they build group subgroup relations between these groups. For each group, they work out the set of invariant polynomials that was well ahead of, you know, at the time there was no mathematica or no software, so they may, they must have done everything uh, by hand. And uh, in the end, they, they make a full list of, uh, of stable fixed points which exist in this dimension. And so until recently, this was uh, the, the state of the art. And so this year, uh, so Jun Chen Rong, who is uh, our postdoc, he uh, realized that uh, this problem is doable also in n equal 5. And so now I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, we have uh, solved this problem that Louis Michel solved uh, 40 years ago, we uh, only now we managed to solve the n equal 5 case. Uh, and so, uh, of Louis Michel lives on. Y a-t-il des questions, des commentaires, and there questions or comments, Jean-Pierre? When you present a functional A, you add a quadratic term, cubic term, but the coefficient is one. Is it because you rescale the lambda or? Yeah, for this, uh, normally, if you know, it's done in four minus epsilon dimensions, and there is a coefficient epsilon in front of lambda, and there are also high nonlinear terms. But for this question of stability, uh, you can neglect the higher nonlinear terms, and then you rescale the first coefficient to have to the first term to have coefficient one. So that's what I did for this purpose, for the purposes of this talk. Thank you. <coughs> Encore merci.